Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of God. God is good. And all the time. Psalm 100 verse 5. For the Lord is good. He is merciful. And his truth endureth to all generations. And as I frequently say. Truth will endure as long as there is God. But one day. Error. False doctrines will come to an end along with those who persist in living their lives by error. But your presence tells me that you love the truth. Jesus says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If the truth makes you free, what does error do? It binds you. It enslaves you. It handcuffs you. But truth, Jesus says, makes you free. And Jesus said in verse 32 of John 8, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Then he says in verse 36, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free. Indeed, he says, truth will make you free in John 8, 32. The Son will make you free in John 8, 36. What do you get from that? Jesus is the truth that sets us free. How was your day? Mine was very quiet. I thank God for that. There are a lot of people who don't know what a quiet day is. What a peaceful day is. Some parts of the world, it's all bullets flying and bombs going off. We thank God for a quiet life. Can you say amen? I mean, there are people who do not know what a quiet, restful, peaceful, relaxed day is. Because at any time, they may lose their lives to violence. But we thank God for a quiet day. I thank God for freedom of worship in this blessed country. I thank him for your love of the word, and I thank him for the high honor of speaking for him. Is there anyone present who is sick? Anyone sick? All right. Come, let me pray for you. Anybody else? You're sick. Come, let me pray for you. Now, I have no power, but the powers of God. Are you with me? Let me read a couple of Bible verses for you. Okay, let me go to the mic and it's being recorded so you can get on the recording. Psalm 103, verse 3. The Bible says, Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. And so we have a connection between the removal of sins and the removal of sickness. In uh, Exodus 15, verse 26, and said, if thou wilt diligently hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Give me one word for that. Obey. And will do that which is right in his sight. Give me one word. Come on, one word. And will give ear to his commandments. One word. And keep all his statutes. One word. I will put none of these diseases upon you, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. God says, I'll put illness on your enemies. I'll put health on you, but you must obey me. Uh, uh, Exodus 23, 25, And ye shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. James 5, 14 to 16, If any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. 
and if he hath committed sins, they shall be forgiven. For every text I use, there's a connection between health and the forgiveness and a removing of sin. And so I'll pray for my lovely sister that God will have mercy upon her. Bow, eyes closed. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the access we have to you through Christ. We thank you, Father, that in John 8 17 and Matthew 8 17, the Bible says, Christ took our sicknesses and our infirmities to the cross. And so the sacrifice that covers sins also covers sickness. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray to God, touch your daughter whom you love. Remove her affliction, dear God. Ease her aches and pains to such a degree she will know that you have moved in her life. Grant her that healing. Grant her that relief, dear God, I pray. And put a testimony on her lips. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen, amen and Amen. God bless you, my sister. Our subject for this evening. The ultimate sacrifice. What was our subject on Friday night? Let's see who's the smartest person in this building. Just look around. Just look around. What was it Sabbath morning? The go between Sabbath afternoon. I'm very good, Dr. Bonnie. Okay. A member of the club. Yes. And this evening, what did I say? The ultimate sacrifice. That's right. Let's pray. Father... Touch my mouth with a coal from the altar. Touch my mind with the spirit of the Lord. Grant me the humility of Jesus Christ. Remind me constantly, dear God, that I am in this pulpit for your glory, not mine. And so possess me, absolutely possess me. I want to be Holy Spirit possessed. Bless those listening with comprehension. Those who will listen to the recorded version, open their minds and their eyes, dear God, that they may not only see the truth, but accept it. Again, I ask you to bless this country, give wisdom to the leaders, dear God, and remind them that the Most High ruleth in the kingdoms of men. Hear this humble prayer, Father. I offer it in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Our subject, the ultimate sacrifice. Let us go to Genesis 15. It's 7 15. I'll release you on or before 8. Welcome to you, my dear sister. Thanks for joining us. God bless you. Let me thank my sisters in the lobby for the hard work you do with registration. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. And those who handle the sound system, God bless you. God bless you. Everything has to work in order that God might be glorified. What book did I say? Genesis, what chapter? 15, let's read from verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy great reward. But why did God say that to Abram? In chapter 14. Let's go there and get some background information. <clears throat> let's read from verse 21. Let me set it up for you. Four armies invaded the area where Abraham lived. You see that in verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elisar, Kedoleoma, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemibu, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. And so we have four kings coming across the Euphrates River to fight the kings of the cities of the plain where Abraham lived. They took Lot, Abraham's nephew, captive. Abraham arms 318 of his servants, pursues them, of course, at God's direction, defeats them, brings back Lot, brings back all the captives, brings back all the goods. Verse 21, And the king of Sodom said unto Abraham, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. In other words, when they were conquered, the conquering nations took all the people. That would happen back then. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, and I will not take from a thread, even to a shoe latchet, 
and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou should say, I have made Abram rich. Save only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the young men which went with me in Eshcol and Mamre, let them take their portion. Now, because Abraham won the battle and brought back all the goods, he naturally had a right to these things. But he gave it all up. And so in a certain sense, he lost. Go to chapter 13. You read from verse 10. Let me set it up for you. Abraham and Lot, they increased in cattle and flocks and herds and tents. And so the land where they were living could not accommodate both of them. Abraham suggested, let us separate for the sake of peace. Because some conflict had arisen between the herdmen of Abraham and the herdmen of Lot. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere. Verse 10. Before the Lord destroys Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. So Lot looks around and he sees where all the grass is, where all the water is, because he has cattle and sheep. Verse 11. Then Lot chose him all the plain of, Lot, of Sodom, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and dwelt, Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. Now, Abraham gave Lot first choice. Lot chose the place with all the grass and all the water. Left the rocky soil for Abraham, who also had flocks and herds, and needed grass and water. Now, let me say this. Because God had called Abram, not Lot. But Lot, realizing the call of God on Abraham, he came with him. Are you following me? The safest place to be in a time of trouble is next to a genuine child of God. Mm -hmm. When God sent an angel to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot said, let me go to this city. The angel said, okay, go. And I will not destroy that city. Why? Because you will be in that city. You understand? Let me say it again. <laughs> Let me say it differently. The sinners of this world do not understand that the reason why this world still spins is because God has people on it. Anyway, Lord shows him all the good land. Verse 13. But the men of Sodom was wicked sinners and wicked before the Lord exceedingly now verse 14 and the Lord said unto Abram after that Lot was separated from him lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward we talked about that yesterday for all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it unto thy seed forever God tells Abraham I will give you everything you see in other words don't be so discouraged that Lot chose all the grassy area and all the well-watered areas. God said, the day will come and I will give you this entire world, including the place that Lot chose. So Abraham, so we see in chapter 13, Abraham suffered a loss. He lost a good land because he sacrificed his right to choose first. By the way, the Christian must learn to sacrifice his or her rights for the sake of God's name. Never sacrifice a principle, but be willing to sacrifice a right. You come to the intersection, you came there first, but this guy pulls out. He come, don't rush across and cause an accident. Give up your right. Let him go. Are you following me? There are a lot of accidents that occur because I got there first. So I have to pull out. We must learn to give up our rights when necessary, but never give up a principle. And so God told Abraham, all that you see, I'll give to you. And so Abraham suffered a loss in chapter 13. Lot took the good land. He suffered a loss in chapter 14 because he gave all the treasures to the king of Sodom. Now, in verse 1 of chapter 15, listen to God. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Lot took the good land in chapter 13. The kings of Sodom took all the loot that you brought back. I am your reward. And sometimes God allows us to suffer loss that he may emphasize the fact 
I am your reward. Not simply, I have a reward. I am your reward. You know, Jesus says, I am the light. I am the life. I am love. I am your reward. Now, in verse 2. And Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me? Seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. Now, Abraham is reminding God what God said in chapter 12. Let's go to chapter 12 and read from verse 1. Our subject, the ultimate sacrifice. Chapter 12, reading verse 1. And I hope you come away after this sermon with a clearer view of how good God is. Now, let me pray again. Father, as I continue, speak clearly through me, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the Lord had said unto Abram, Genesis 12, verse 1, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God promised Abraham he would be a mighty nation. Now, go to chapter 11. Let's read verses 30 and 31 of Genesis 11. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarah, and the name of um, Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iska. Now, you read verse 31, but Sarai was barren. She had no child. Abraham married a woman who could not have children. Now, keep this in mind. You listen to verse 2 of chapter 12. And I will make of thee what? A great nation. But his wife couldn't have children. Now this really has to cause Abraham to think, how will this happen? We always want all the questions answered. That's the way human beings are. I want all my, why did my husband leave me? Why did my wife leave me? But the pastor can't answer that. But we want answers to our questions, and that's perfectly legitimate. But sometimes God does not give the answers. He just says, trust me. Because I don't lie. So God told a man with a barren wife, you'll be the father of many nations. Now in chapter 15, verse 2 now, let's go back there. Our subject, the ultimate sacrifice. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me? In other words, I want a son. Seeing I go childless. And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. Abraham had decided to make Eliezer his heir because he had no son. And Abraham said, Behold to me, verse 3, thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in mine house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own what? Mm -hmm. shall be thine heir. In other words, you and Sarah will produce a child. Abraham knows Sarah cannot have children. Having a child was impossible for Sarai. Her name became Sarah in chapter 17, by the way. That's why I keep calling her Sarai. But I call her Sarah. It was impossible for Sarah to have a child. It was not impossible for God to give a child to a barren woman. That's the trust you and I must have in God. We must believe that God can do what in our eyes looks what? Impossible. Verse 5. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. The Hebrew word tell means to count. Tell the star, can you count? Of course he couldn't. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Wait a minute, God. Have you forgotten my wife is barren? No, says God. Have you forgotten who I am? The barrenness of your wife is not a problem for me. The Red Sea was not a problem for God. Hunger in the wilderness was not a problem for God. 
Thirst in the wilderness was not a problem for God. My brothers, my sisters, listen to me. Your problem is your problem. For you, it is not a problem for God. Whatever it is. And he believed in the Lord for six. And he counted it to him for righteousness. That's righteousness by faith, by the way. That's the key text Paul uses to prove righteousness by faith. All Abraham did was to believe what God said. Let me say it differently. Abraham believed the impossible. God said, I'm covering you with the righteousness of my son. And he said unto him, verse 7, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. Now Abraham expressed faith in God in verse 6, but now he wants a little reassurance. Sometimes our faith, you know, the, the, the knees of our faith begin to knock. We have not need faith, you see. So they knock from time to time. So Abraham says in verse 7, in verse 8, and verse 7, God says, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. I'll give it to you, of course, and to your seed. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Can you give me a clue? Can you show me some sign, dear God, that you're with me as I move from Chestertown to Tampa Bay, Florida? Can you show me a little sign you're with me as I graduate from college and I try to enter the work world? Can you give me some little sign that you're with me? I just lost my job and I've got three children. Can you give me some indication you'll sustain me? It's human. Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said to him, take me an heifer of three years old. And a she-goat, a three years old. And a ram, a three years old. And a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took on to him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each beast once against the other. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. Let me explain that. Why did he cut the carcasses? This was the custom back then. You see, when the Bible says God made a covenant, in verse 18 of uh, Genesis 15, in that day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, the Hebrew word means to cut a covenant. To make a covenant is to cut a covenant. Not only the Israelites, but non-Israelite nations back then, the king would make a covenant with his people. And they would cut an animal into two. And one person would pass through, the other person would pass through what they were saying. If I don't keep my side of the bargain, let this happen to me. Are you with me? What they were saying, if I don't keep my word, let this that happened to the animals happen to me. Verse 17, And it came to pass, when the sun went down, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp which passed between those pieces. God came down and passed between the pieces. You see the same thing in Jeremiah 38, 34 verses 18 and 19, where this is referred to. Not the same incident, but the custom of people passing between pieces saying, if I don't keep my side of the bargain, let this be my fate. What is God saying, Abraham? If I cannot keep my word to you, let this be my fate. I don't deserve to be God. If I cannot keep my word. Because I cannot lie. And I've told you, you'll have a son. Yes, I know your wife is barren. I saw she was barren in her mother's womb. And I chose to leave her barren. That I may use her barrenness to build your faith. God said, cut the animals. God passed through. Abraham surely passed through. God is telling Abraham, 
I am the ultimate sacrifice. Not those and I. If I cannot keep my word, give you the lamb, save you, give you all the blessings, that's what I deserve. Now go to Hebrews 6. 731 on the dot. 731. If you have time, don't panic. Is our theme for this two weeks. You have Hebrews 6. You read verse 13. Now Paul is referring to God and Abraham and their interaction, not only in 15, but also 22. For when God made promise to Abraham, read with me now if you have my version, because he could swear by no greater. Come on, he swear by himself. God is saying, I put myself on the line. You hear in my words, are you getting what I'm trying to say? God says, I am my own collateral. If I cannot keep the word, the promise I made to you, if I cannot keep my side of the bargain, I don't deserve to be God. What's our subject? The ultimate sacrifice. Let's go to verse 17 of Hebrews 6. But God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, finish that verse, confirmed it. Now, in verse 13, for when God made what? Come on, when God made promise. But in verse 17, what do we have? We have promise in 13. What do we have in 17? Oh, we have two things. God only needed to make a promise, not an oath. You see, someone who cannot lie does not need an oath. He just speaks or she just speaks and that's it because the person cannot lie. I want you to understand the extent to which God will go to reassure you, I can save you. I can deliver you from that addiction. I can change your life. So I've made a promise and to put your mind at ease regarding my ability to keep my word, I am backing it up with something I do not need, and that is an oath. God didn't ask Abraham for an oath. Because not what you do. It's what God does. Yes, God expects obedience, yes, but salvation is what God does. And so God did not require an Abraham an oath. We ought to stop making promises to God. So often we don't keep them. And the Bible says, you make a vow to me, you don't keep it. I don't have time for fools, the Bible says. I don't, says God. God makes promises to us. He does not call upon us to make promises to him. He calls upon us to believe his promises. God says to you and to me, if we confess our sins, you've killed 25 people all over the state of Maryland. God says, if you come to me and confess, I will forgive you. He didn't say that the state police will. He said, I will forgive you. For 25 murders? Yes. I'll forgive you. And when God forgives, he heals, he narrows, he, he, he removes the gap, the distance between the sinner and the Savior. When God heals and forgives, he heals that broken relationship and he brings about restoration. When we forgive, we ask the person to move to another state. Someone hurt you, I forgive you, I forgive you, now leave, go to live in Michigan. God says, I forgive you, come sit on my lap. Come on, say amen. I forgive you. I forgive you. God has not called upon you to forgive yourself. A lot of us walk around with guilt because we are unable to forgive ourselves. Forgiveness is God's work. Nowhere does the Bible call upon you or me to forgive ourselves. If we could do that, the death of Christ was a waste. And so God told Abraham, 
If I don't keep my word, that's what he's actually saying. Let this be my fate, my outcome. I do not deserve to be God. What am I trying to tell you? God goes the extra mile to reassure us. I'll keep my word because I cannot lie. But since you do not fully accept that I cannot lie, I will do what I've never done before. I will speak an oath. Calvary is proof that God was the ultimate sacrifice. He actually died in Christ. Let me say that differently. Divinity cannot die. Did I say that clearly? Divinity cannot die. But the Bible says God was where? In Christ. Come on. Reconciling the world unto himself. In a way I cannot explain. God gave himself through Jesus Christ. The ultimate sacrifice. Christ, the way whereby God gave himself for us. The ultimate sacrifice. My brothers and my sisters, God wants to do things in your lives that you do not now imagine. And the number one, of course, is to save you and grant you a place in his kingdom when he comes and believe you me, God is coming. But he's coming for those who have lived by his word. And to live by the word of God is to live believing the promises of God. Let's look at the very first promise of God. Go to Genesis. The very first promise of God has never changed. It's fundamental. It's basic. Genesis 3, this three, verse 15. You have that? Genesis 3.15. Let me pray while you're still searching. Fathers, I continue, and I haven't got much more to go. Continue to direct my mind, I pray, please. In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. God says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, because you and I cannot put it. Let me say differently. You and I cannot of ourselves hate sin. Let's go to Romans 3. Look at me as if to say, please explain that some more. Romans 3 is 20 after, or 20 minutes to 8. I'll release you before or at 8. Don't worry. What book did I say? What chapter? 3. Let's read from verse 10. You have that? You have my version? Read with me. What does that say? As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Keep reading. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. Stop. Let me deal with that. If God does not seek you and me, we cannot be saved. Let me say it differently. There is nothing in the flesh that desires God. Which means God has to do something first. Even before we're converted, he has to do something. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Let me show you what I mean. Ephesians 2. You have that? We read from verse 1. Read with me if you don't mind. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, what's the condition of the person in verse 1? Dead in sin. Now, what does the Bible say about the dead? The dead know nothing, physically or spiritually. Tell me you're following me. Tell me you're following me. You're following me? The dead know nothing. Consequently, for a dead person to accept Christ, Christ first has to wake up that dead person. 
So the person then can accept Christ. That is why that wino in the gutter can accept Christ in the gutter. Because Christ has shed the light of life into his mind. And you realize, just, I need a savior. Now that he's been made alive sufficiently to accept Christ. A dead person cannot accept Christ. So it's God. What people do, they resist the light of that life. And God can't force it. There's none that understandeth. Romans 3 verse 11. There's none that seeketh after God. I say again, our faith must be in what God can do. In what God has promised to do. I will put enmity between thee and the woman. The Lord can put into you and into me hatred for sin. Because he knows the things we hate, we avoid. Let me say it more positively. The Lord can put into your heart and mind love for his law, which is love for righteousness, which is love for right doing, which is love for obedience. And Jesus died. And through the death of Christ, the Father gave himself. God was in Christ. Reconciling the world unto himself. And reconciliation is based upon death. So tonight, God wants to remind you. He is the ultimate. Parents, you make sacrifices for your children. Don't raise your hands. Don't say anything. I know you do. When I was a little boy growing up in the West Indies. It was not uncommon for parents to have two jobs. Trying to, you know, put their children through school. The child would come home. The parents washed the uniform. He only had one. So it can be dry. Put it on the line because there's no winter over there. It dries next morning. He can go to school clean. The parents make that sacrifice every day for years. The United States, the estimate is it takes about $280,000 to raise a child up to the age of 18. And people have six, seven, eight children. And they define the money. Are you following me? They find the money. Sacrifice. Knowing there will be no refund. They find the money. God says, I sacrifice to you. That one day, you and I may have that relationship that I had with Adam before he sinned. King Charles was coronated or crowned a couple of days ago. There were crowds all over the place. All the pomp and majesty and ceremony. It was a very impressive thing. Horses and uniforms I've never seen in my life. That's the way it will be ten times more, a million times more, when Christ is crowned in heaven and we're there with him. We have to be there for that to happen. And people trying to reach out to shake hands. And God is saying to you, I'm reaching out to you. You see, we try to shake the hands of celebrities. Mm -hmm. We call it the red carpet. We have photographers, people reaching out behind barriers, shake this person's hand. God is reaching out to shake our hand. And you read so far that through his son, he gave himself. What more could God do? Nothing more. An omnipotent God could do nothing more than what he has done. And so tonight, I want you to ponder that God made the ultimate sacrifice by giving himself in Christ. As he told Abraham in Genesis 15, as he passed through the pieces, symbolizing, let this be my fate if I cannot keep my promise. The problem is not you and I keeping promises to God. The problem is you and I believing in the promises God has made to us. If you listen to the call of Abraham, it's a 12 minutes to 8. Now the Lord has said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred 
and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee. I will make thy name great. Thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee. I will curse him that curse thee. I, I, I will do all of that. Just obey me. Tonight, from tomorrow or night on, the first couple of days I wanted to establish the reliability of God and his word. If a God who cannot tell a lie makes you a promise and combines it with an oath and you cannot accept that, there's nothing else God can do. But God has sent his spirit to nudge us, to tell us, accept that promise. Accept that promise. Abraham died not having received the promises. Hebrews 11 verse 13. But God will wake him up one day to receive that promise because God's word must be fulfilled. God said, if you bring a tithe, I'll bless you so that you will not have room for it. He cannot lie. How many of you will say with me, Father, help me to trust, believe the promises you have made. Can I see your hand? The promises you have made, stand up with us or with me. Sermons are dangerous things. Let me explain why they're dangerous. The Bible says it had been better not to have known the way of righteousness than after you've known it to turn from the holy commandment committed unto you, unto them. It's better never to have heard of God's word than to hear it and not make a response. So as you leave tonight, you must think, Father, is there something you said to me I don't believe? Am I functioning on unbelief or do I believe your word? We are so accustomed to being disappointed by people, we think God is like people. So this person disappointed me, my teacher, my friend, the policeman, the politician, my spouse, my children, they've disappointed me and we take that and we put that on God, we expect him to disappoint us. God is not like us. And so tonight as you go, contemplate, tell God, Father, with your help, help me to believe your promises. And God's greatest promise is that he will save us. We have to believe that. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father in heaven, thank you for the simplicity of your word. Thank you, dear God, for going the extra mile to convince us that your word can be trusted, the word of salvation. Up to and including giving yourself through Christ, the ultimate sacrifice. As we leave there, Father, let us take individual inventory, realizing that you can help us conquer those areas where we're weak. Remind us you can provide for us as verily as you provided for the Israelites. Remind us, dear God, you can defend us from our enemies as verily as you defended the Israelites from their enemies. And above all, remind us, Father, that no matter how much we see ourselves as terrible sinners, if we trust you, you can save us. Bless us, take us safely home, put a double blessing on our children, I pray, and bring us back tomorrow, Father, please, in Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen.